Thank you. I'm grateful to the Veritas Forum for the invitation to participate in tonight's dialogue, and I'd also like to thank Kevin Sharp for his willingness to join in. We're here to discuss whether there is evidence for God. I think that there is. In fact, I'm convinced that God's existence best explains a wide range of the data of human experience. Let me mention briefly six. One, God is the best explanation why anything at all exists. This is the most fundamental question of philosophy. Suppose you were hiking through the woods and found a ball lying on the ground. You would naturally wonder how it came to be there. If your hiking buddy said to you, forget about it, it just exists inexplicably, you'd think that he was either joking or else just wanted you to keep moving. No one would take seriously the idea that the ball just exists without any explanation. Why not? Because the ball is contingent in its existence. It can exist, but it doesn't have to exist. So what makes the ball different from, say, unicorns, which can exist, but do not exist? Very simply, there is something that explains the ball's existence, typically a causal explanation. Now, notice that merely increasing the size of the ball, even until it becomes coextensive with the universe, does nothing to provide or remove the need for an explanation of its existence. So, what is the explanation of the universe? whereby the universe, I mean all of space-time reality. The explanation of the universe can be found only in a transcendent reality beyond the universe, beyond space and time, which is metaphysically necessary in its existence. Now there's only one way I can think of to get a contingent entity like the universe from a necessarily existing cause. And that is, if the cause is a personal agent who can freely choose to create a contingent reality. It therefore follows that the best explanation of the existence of the contingent universe is a transcendent personal being, which is what everybody means by God. We can summarize this reasoning as follows. One, Every contingent thing has an explanation of its existence. Two, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is a transcendent personal being. Three, the universe is a contingent thing. Four, therefore the universe has an explanation of its existence. Five, therefore the explanation of the universe is a transcendent personal being which is what everybody means by God. Number two, God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. Atheists have typically held that the universe never had a beginning, but is just eternal in the past. But we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. In 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. Because we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity, we can't provide a physical description of the first split second of the universe. But any sort of quantum physical state which may have characterized the early universe cannot be eternal in the past because it is unstable and so must have had an absolute beginning. Even if our universe is just a part of a so-called multiverse composed of many universes, the universe itself or the multiverse itself must have had an absolute beginning. Of course, Highly speculative scenarios like loop quantum gravity models, string models, even closed time-like curves have been proposed to try to avoid this absolute beginning. 
These models are fraught with problems. But the bottom line is that none of these theories, even if true, succeed in restoring an eternal past. According to Vilenkin, none of these scenarios can actually be past eternal. He concluded all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. But then the inevitable question arises, why did the universe come into being? What brought the universe into existence? There must have been a transcendent cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument as follows. One, the universe began to exist. Two, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause. Three, therefore the universe has a transcendent cause. By the very nature of the case, that cause must be a timeless, spaceless, immaterial being. Now there are only two types of things that could possibly fit that description. Either an abstract object, like a number, or else an unembodied mind or consciousness. But my, uh, abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. The number seven, for example, has no effect upon anything. Therefore, the cause of the universe is plausibly an unembodied mind. And thus we're brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Three. God is the best explanation of the applicability of mathematics to the physical world. Philosophers and scientists have puzzled over what physicist Eugene Wigner called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. How is it that a theorist like Peter Higgs can sit down at his desk and by poring over mathematical equations predict the existence of a fundamental particle which 30 years later, after investing millions of dollars and thousands of man hours, experimentalists are finally able to detect. Mathematics is the language of nature. But how is this to be explained? If mathematical objects are abstract entities causally isolated from the universe, then the applicability of mathematics to the physical world is, in the words of the philosopher of mathematics, Mary Lang, a happy coincidence. On the other hand, if mathematical objects are just useful fictions, then how is it that nature is written in the language of these fictions? The naturalist has no explanation for the uncanny applicability of mathematics to the physical world. By contrast, the theist has a ready explanation. When God created the universe, he designed it on the mathematical structure which he had in mind. We can summarize this argument as follows. One, if God did not exist, the applicability of mathematics would be a happy coincidence. Two, the applicability of mathematics is not a happy coincidence. Three, therefore, God exists. Number four, God is the best explanation of the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. Now, there are three live explanatory options for this extraordinary fine tuning physical necessity, chance, or design. Physical necessity is not, however, a plausible explanation because the finely tuned constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. Therefore, they are not physically necessary. So could the fine tuning be due to chance? The problem with this explanation is that the odds of a life-permitting universe governed by our laws of nature are just so infinitesimal that they cannot be reasonably faced. Therefore, proponents of chance have been forced to postulate the existence of a world ensemble of other universes, 
preferably infinite in number and randomly ordered so that life permitting universes would appear by chance somewhere in the ensemble. Not only is this hypothesis, to borrow Richard Dawkins' phrase, an unparsimonious extravagance, but it faces an insuperable obstacle. By far, most of the observable universes in a world ensemble would be worlds in which a single brain fluctuates into existence out of the vacuum and observes its otherwise empty world. Worlds like that are simply incomprehensibly more plenteous in the world ensemble than worlds like ours. Thus, if our world were just a random member of a world ensemble, we ought to be having observations like that. Since we don't, that strongly disconfirms the world ensemble hypothesis. So chance is also not a good explanation. It follows that design is the best explanation of the fine tuning of the universe. Thus the fine tuning of the universe constitutes evidence for a cosmic designer. Number five, God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of moral values and duties which impose themselves upon us as objectively binding and true. For example, we all recognize that it's wrong to walk into an elementary school with an automatic weapon and shoot little boys and girls and their teachers. On a naturalistic view, however, there's nothing really wrong with that. Moral values are just the subjective byproducts of biological evolution and social conditioning. In Richard Dawkins' words, there is at bottom no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for being. By contrast, the theist grounds objective moral values in God and our moral duties in his commands. The theist thus has the explanatory resources, which the atheist lacks, to ground objective moral values and duties. Hence, we may argue, one, objective moral values and duties exist. Two, but if God did not exist, objective moral values and duties would not exist. Three, therefore, God exists. So if you think that there are at least some things that are really good or evil, you should take a serious look at theism. Number six, God can be personally known and experienced. This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know God exists wholly apart from arguments, simply by personally experiencing him. Philosophers call beliefs like this properly basic beliefs. They aren't based on some other beliefs. Rather, they're part of the foundation of a person's system of beliefs. Other properly basic beliefs would be belief in the reality of the external world or the reality of the past. When you think about it, neither of these beliefs can be proved on the basis of evidence. How could you prove that the world was not created five minutes ago with built-in appearances of age, like food in our stomachs from the breakfast we never really ate, or memory traces in our brains of events we never really experienced? How could you prove that you're not a brain in a vat of chemicals, being stimulated with electrodes by some mad scientist to believe that you're sitting here in this auditorium listening to this lecture. Although these sorts of beliefs are basic for us, that doesn't mean that they're arbitrary. Rather, they are grounded in the sense that they're formed in the context of certain experiences. In the experiential context of seeing and feeling and hearing things, I naturally form the belief that there are certain physical objects which I'm sensing. Thus, my basic beliefs are not arbitrary, but appropriately grounded in experience. There may be no way to prove such beliefs, and yet it is perfectly rational to hold them. You'd have to be crazy to think that you're a brain in a vat 
or that the world was created five minutes ago. Such beliefs are thus not merely basic, but properly basic. In the same way, belief in God can be for those who seek him a properly basic belief grounded in our experience of God. Hence, we may argue, one, beliefs which are appropriately grounded may be rationally accepted as basic beliefs, not grounded on argument. Two, belief that God exists is appropriately grounded. Three, therefore, belief that God exists can be rationally accepted as a basic belief, not grounded on argument. Now, if this is right, then there's a danger that arguments for God could actually distract your attention from God himself. The Bible promises, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so concentrate on the external arguments that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. Good evening, friends. Thanks to the sponsors of tonight's event for inviting me. And thanks to Professor Craig for participating, and thanks to all of you for coming out. So, Professor Craig went first and got to give his case for theism. Going second, I'm now expected to present my position, argue it, and dismantle his. So I better get going. I call the position 21st century atheism. Why 21st century? Because I think we've learned some important lessons in the 20th century about philosophy of religion, and it's time to take advantage of those insights. Next. Let's, play the, uh, let's uh, define the position first. For, we should be formulating theism and atheism in terms of confidence levels, from 0% to 100%, not in terms of belief. Confidence levels are much more precise. For example, if forced to answer who would be the next president, I'd probably say Hillary Clinton, but I'm only at about 51% confidence on that, so there's no way that I would say sincerely Hillary is going to win in normal circumstances. A certain level of confidence is required in order to count as a belief. We should formulate theism and atheism in terms of specific gods or religions. The terms theist about X and atheist about X should be primary. And then you can define general theism and general atheism in terms of those. We also need to distinguish between weak religious views and strong religious views. A weak religious view is greater than 50% confidence. A strong relig religious view is high enough to count as knowledge or outright belief. So using these points, we can map out the various options. Next. On the left, we see Views on whether some god exists. Here I've put in the threshold for belief at 80%, but that's just an example. Saying that it's more probable than not that some god exists means that you only need to show greater than 50% confidence. But saying that we know or believe that some god exists requires a higher confidence level. Next, top and the bottom indicate strong positions. The top, strong theism. The bottom, strong atheism. Next. The middle positions are in between, and they are weak. Just above the 50%, we have weak theism. Just below 50%, weak atheism. Next. Now, on the right, we have the same kind of options, but instead of being about whether there's any gods at all, they're about whether capital G God, the Christian God, exists. And now back to both frameworks. Here we have next 21st century atheism depicted on the previous framework as the red X on the left and the red X on the right. The left X indicates that it's more probable than not that there are no gods at all. The right X indicates that it is, uh, uh, sorry, that there is no Christian God, and that's a high confidence claim. You can imagine a bunch of frameworks just like the one on the right for other sorts of gods, like Zeus or Thor or what have you, and the X is going to be in the same place in each case. Okay. So, 21st century atheism is a fairly simple theory, and the primary argument for it is fairly simple as well. I call it the confidence argument. For any familiar god, including capital G God, the evidence is always either in ancient history or someplace where there are a few witnesses or it's based on someone's private experience. Also, the evidence for it conflicts with our best scientific theories in biology, chemistry, and physics. And we should have way more confidence in those scientific theories than in any existing evidence for any familiar god. 
the confidence argument should give us high enough confidence to say God does not exist, Zeus does not exist, Thor does not exist, and so on. But what about our confidence for the claim that there are no gods at all? Any god that supposedly intervenes in the world in any familiar way is going to be undermined by the confidence argument. And we have no reason to believe in gods that do not intervene in the world at all because they don't need them to explain anything. So there's no reason to think that they do exist, and there's very weak reason to believe they do not exist. Therefore, it's more probable than not that there are no gods. But this confidence isn't high enough to count as knowledge or outright belief. Next. That's my position and my arguments for it. It's important to note that 21st century atheism has nothing to do with the following views. No strong general theism. That would require arguing for high confidence against the existence of all conceivable gods, even those that might want to deceive us about all the evidence, like Descartes' evil deceiver. Defending strong general atheism is, in my view, a sucker's bet. No reductive naturalism. I have no patience with the claim that everything can be reductively explained in terms of science, and it's completely independent of 21st century atheism. I have not argued that religion has bad consequences. I have not implied that theists are stupid. Professor Craig might be the smartest person in the room for all I know. I have not argued that miracles are impossible, only that all the evidence we have for them does not override or even come close to our evidence for scientific theories that conflict with the supposed miracle. Now I want to develop a new kind of criticism of arguments for theism and for Christianity. I call it the appeal to divine psychology. You might have noticed I didn't use the problem of evil in my arguments here at all. That's because contemporary Christian philosophers of religion, to their great credit, have largely dismantled the problem of evil. In essence, the theist points out that we should have no confidence at all in understanding God's global plans or how the evil we see might be outweighed by some more important part of the plan. Then the argument turns into a fight about divine psychology. By divine psychology, I mean what God would do, what God would believe, what God would want, what plans God would have, or what reasons God would have. Arguing with a theist about divine psychology is like arguing with a little kid about his imaginary tea party. And all the parents in the room know that you don't win that argument. No one seems to have realized that the point can be generalized to show that an entire category of arguments is unacceptable. That entire category I call appeals to divine psychology, and it includes many of the theists' favorite arguments as well. Abandoning divine psychology cuts both ways, but it cuts the theist deeper. In particular, cosmological arguments, teleological arguments, explanatory arguments, and miracle arguments all make appeals to divine psychology. The Christian might claim that appeals to divine psychology are just fine, but the theist can't have it both ways. If we allow claims about God's psychology, then the problem of evil comes roaring right back, and you don't want that. Now we need to turn to the arguments for theism and for Christianity in particular. Because my discussion partner is Professor Craig, I'll be focusing on his work and what follows. In assessing his arguments, I will talk as I would to any other professional philosopher whose system I've managed to work my way into. That is, I don't pull punches, but I also never attack character, so it isn't personal. Professor Craig knows this, I know this, I'm saying it for the benefit of the audience in part because I respect the guy. He's got some great philosophical skills, he's a talented system builder, which I admire, and he's done a tremendous service to the atheist movement by trouncing most of our heroes and raising the bar on both sides. <laughs> I'm serious, that's a, major, that's a major benefit, a major thing that we can say thank you for. I've managed to take a look at Professor Craig's entire system, here it is, here's what we have. I think all the major arguments that are here that Professor Craig has either advocated or proposed over the years. It's divided into arguments for theism in general at the top and for Christianity in particular at the bottom. Recall, he just gave the contingency argument, the Kalam argument, the mathematical applicability argument, the fine-tuning argument, the moral argument, and the experience argument. Four arguments from the top, two arguments from the bottom. That's the six he just gave. Next. In this table, Professor Craig's arguments are on the left and some major problems are on the top. Next, we can see first a previously unknown problem that affects the entire system. I call it the weakness problem. It's sort of highlighted in blue up there. Professor Craig has routinely defended his argument, arguments for theism by saying that he only needs to convince you that the premises are more plausible than not. But it should be obvious that it takes more than 51% confidence for knowledge or outright belief. Look back at the earlier framework for illustration. 
Here's what Professor, here, here is what Professor Craig argues for. These are the way his arguments are presented. Next. These are the conclusions that he draws from them. Go back. Those are the way he defends his premises. And again, forward. Those are the conclusions. So, ultimately, he's been defending his arguments as if he, advo as if he advocates weak theism. But he's been advertising his view as if it's strong theism. So the weakness problem is that his arguments are far weaker than they need to be to support his very strong conclusions. Therefore, no one should take any of these arguments seriously until they are completely redefended from the ground up to match the standard Professor Craig has set for himself. Otherwise, he could backpedal and opt for weak theism, but either way, the entire system needs to be reworked. While there are plenty of interesting things to say, uh, I, I don't really need to do any more to undermine the entire system of arguments with the exception of the experience argument at the bottom. It doesn't have any X's at all, but don't let that fool you. That just makes it uh, very different from the other ones. I do want to emphasize a couple of points. Look at the divine psychology objection. The problem affects a lot of the arguments up here, and it's uh, uh, not going to affect the moral argument, but everyone except for moral and experience of the ones that he presented, it's there. Next, think about explanation. Professor Craig routinely formulates his arguments as inferences to the best explanation. I don't know if you noticed that, but every single one of the first five arguments were formulated as inferences to the best explanation tonight. However, he admits that it's almost impossible to determine what God would do or plan at all. For example, if we think of God alone existing all by himself, then there's no way to infer that God would even create the universe. Professor Craig freely admits that the God hypothesis doesn't make any predictions, but it also, it also makes no retrodictions. A retrodiction is like a prediction, but it, it's predicting something that we already know, know about, like the existence of the universe. The God hypothesis offers no predictions, no retrodictions, and as such, it's a terrible explanation. Moral argument. The first premise states that if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist either. In arguing for this premise, Professor Craig just assumes that the atheist has to explain all morality in terms of evolutionary theory. He said it again tonight. But that is so completely wrong that you can't know anything about the whole history of ethics over the last century if you espouse that. There are literally dozens of theories of moral values and moral duties that are objective, not naturalist, and make no appeal to gods. For example, G.E. Moore, Sir William David Ross, Christine Korsgaard, Thomas Scanlon, Derek Parfit, Philippa Foote, David Enoch, Russ Schaefer Landau, Rosalind Hershaus, John McDowell, Jonathan Dancy, H.A. Pritcher, Roger Crisp, Joseph Raz, Gene Hampton, and Rafe Wedgwood. That's just a few. Therefore, until he's refuted every single one of these theories, he needs to stop using the moral argument. The lesson for everybody else, stop assuming that atheists cannot accept that there are objective moral values. All it demonstrates is that you know nothing about ethics. Next. Finally, Professor Craig makes a big deal of his knowledge of cosmology, and he uses it in the Kalam argument and the fine-tuning argument, both arguments that you saw tonight. However, he rejects evolutionary theory and with it contemporary biology in favor of intelligent design, which is the idea that biological species developed by God's guidance. But it doesn't make sense to claim to be an expert on cosmology and at the same time reject evolution. That's just cherry picking. Does he think there's a magic dividing line between biology and chemistry? How do you think the fine tuning argument even works? Those calculations are about biochemistry, and that's the basis for evolutionary theory and biology. At this point, we understand life well enough that if you reject evolutionary theory, it's pretty easy to trace out how you would have to reject chemistry and ultimately physics as well. So, Professor Craig, from one philosopher to another, please drop intelligent design. I would like to have a stronger opponent than that. It does nothing to help you, and it makes you look like you're more scared of evolutionary theory than Richard Dawkins is scared of you. And we both know that's pretty scared. <laughs> we don't need to go through much more, partly because for the apologist, these arguments are just smoke and mirrors anyway, and as we'll see, their fate has no impact on the apologist's belief that God exists. The real heart of the system is the experience argument. We'll turn to that. Professor Craig claims that even if all the other arguments for God's existence were shown to be worthless, that would have absolutely zero impact on his belief that God exists. That's because his own religious experience uh, tells him that he knows God exists independently of any argument 
or evidence. He makes two appeals to justify this radical thesis. First, the belief that God exists is a basic belief because it's like a perceptual belief. And second, that his religious experience is an intrinsic defeater defeater. This means that his experience is so powerful that it undermines any reason one might have to doubt it. So according to Professor Craig, his religious experience is so powerful, it allows him to know God exists, it can never be reasonably doubted, and he doesn't have to provide any arguments for it at all. You gotta hand it to the guy, he knows where his weak spot is. The fact is, religious experiences do not fit well into basic structure because they don't have, they don't act like perceptual experiences at all. Perceptual experiences are backed up by other evidence, including biology. Not so for religious experience. And in addition, we've got very good reason to think that there are no intrinsic defeater defeaters, because any experience can be misleading. Indeed, we can stimulate a person's brain in certain ways and cause them to have very powerful religious experiences, even though they aren't experiencing anything. If Professor Craig's experience was truly an intrinsic defeater defeater, it would have to defeat all of neuroscience that potentially undermines it, and that's absurd. Subjective experiences, even really, 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 really powerful ones, are just that subjective. All by themselves, they don't allow us to know anything objective. By far the biggest problem with the experience argument is that it's supposed to justify being an apologist, which is how Professor Craig identifies. The apologist is concerned first and foremost with defending the belief that God exists. There's never an attempt to figure out whether it's true that God exists, and the apologist is completely opposed to even considering that God might not exist. I am ready to become a Christian tonight. But Professor Craig, because he's an apologist, has decided to put becoming an atheist completely out of the question. The apologist puts this belief that God exists completely out of bounds for critical thinking. Being an apologist is seriously irrational. First of all, putting any belief completely out of bounds for criti critical thinking is irrational. How irrational? Well, we have lots of great theories of rationality and critical thinking, but none of them can even model the apologist's irrationality. For example, you might be able to come close if you stipulate that the belief in God has to be 100% confidence, but Professor Craig emphatically denies that. So he's suggesting that we should take a belief that isn't even certain and put it out of bounds for critical thinking. Our best theories of rationality can account for a lot of kinds of irrationality, but the apologist's irrationality is so extreme that it can't even be modeled at all. Being an apologist is off the charts irrational. When discussing the case of Ryan Bell, the pastor who tried atheism for a year and lost his faith, Professor Craig freely admits that any Christian who allows Christianity to be subject to critical thinking just like any other belief is probably going to end up an atheist. That's Professor Craig's own stated view. The greatest Christian apologist of the last half century is convinced that if the Christian gives the belief that God exists a fair shake in the process of rational belief revision, then the belief that God exists is going to lose. Let that sink in for a second. Finally, why should we care about any of this? Well, it has a huge impact on social issues. In particular, apologetics tends to creep into related beliefs and lead to arbitrary hatefulness. For example, Professor Craig campaigns against same-sex marriage and the right for same-sex couples to adopt. To try to undermine some perfectly great parents' right to have kids is a personal disgrace, and moreover, it's not supported by anything in the Bible or entailed by anything that is. Of course, there's no outcry about single people adopting kids, nor is there an outcry about rich people adopting kids, even though greed is mentioned right along with homosexuality in 1 Corinthians and is emphasized over and over throughout the New Testament. When Professor Craig cites evidence for his view, he focuses exclusively on the four studies that suggest some problems for kids from same-sex households. Conveniently, he ignores the over 70 studies, concluding that there are no problems specific to kids from same-sex households. Professor Craig, don't forget, you can always change your mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So the next uh, part of our evening together is a moderated dialogue where I'm the moderator. <laughs> and uh, um, what I want to do is just, uh, it's gonna, I think we have about 20 minutes or so of this, and then we're going to move to an audience uh, question and answer period after that. So. 
I guess I'd like to start off in just a kind of a general way, uh, since you both uh, listened to the other person give their presentations, and maybe I'll start with Dr. Craig, because uh, Kevin had an opportunity to respond to some of what you said. But if you um, had a question, um, having listened to um, uh, Dr. Sharp uh, just now, uh, you know, would you want to get us started with a particular kind of sure. question? Sure. Well, thank you for that very robustious uh, response. Yeah. I think that the YouTube video of this event will repay uh, close study, since yeah. this was like drinking from a fire hose tonight. And uh, this will be valuable for people in the future, I think. I do have a question about something you said that Absolutely. rather puzzled me. Sure. Um, you characterized weak theism as having a greater than 50% confidence right. level. Um, and then talked about how I draw stronger conclusions than that. I think this was the so-called weakness problem, that yes. I draw stronger conclusions uh, from arguments whose premises I say are simply more plausible than their contradictories. Right. Now, the way I understand this, Kevin, is that what I was trying to do was to set minimum thresholds for reasonable theistic belief. Good. And the idea there was that in a deductive argument, if the conjunction of the premises is more plausible than not, then that suffices for what you said, a weak theism, a confidence right. in theism. Now, right. I myself think that those premises are far more plausible than not, Good. but that's just meant to set a minimum threshold to get somebody like yourself into the kingdom. Uh, I don't... Even though I... Yeah, that's it, what you should be doing. But... So, it seems to me there really isn't a, yeah. a weakness problem there. I don't get in the kingdom unless I believe, right? What? I don't get in the kingdom unless right, I believe. Right, right. So 51% I want to set the is not enough low. for belief. 51% is not enough for belief. Belief requires higher confidence than that. Ah, okay, then I, I misunderstood what you were saying. Yeah, I so thought you were saying that a confidence level of 51% would be enough for having a, a weak theistic belief. It, uh, no, weak theism, so thinking that theism is more probable than not. But okay. that doesn't justify you in saying, I believe God exists or I know God exists. What? That's what you want. Okay, I, okay, then I misunderstood what you're saying. Now suppose I have a confidence that in the premises of these arguments that leads me to the, think that the conclusion is true. If, yes. if the logic is valid, yes. and I think that the premises taken together are more plausible than not, yes. then it follows that the conclusion is true. So why would I not believe the conclusion? Good. So the, this is, I think, a good example of why the debate shouldn't be cast in terms of belief, right? You said, I think the conclusion is true, right? You believe the conclusion is true. Fine. But instead, it makes more sense to cast them in terms of confidence levels. If you have 51% on all of your confidence, for the confidence levels for the premises of your argument, mm -hmm. and it's a deductive argument, then your conclusion isn't going to end up somehow being 70 or 80% confidence, right? Well, all those... Uh, probability levels for the premises do is set a minimum yep. level for the probability of the conclusion in a deductive so let me argument, try to it could be much higher. So let me try to rephrase. Your minimum level needs to be much higher in order to get your conclusion to convince somebody to believe that God exists, as opposed to just say, I think it's more probable than not. Yeah, Those are I, different. I, well, I, it puzzles me. Why would, if, if you think it's more probable than not, if you think this is more probably true than false, I would guess I would say that is enough for belief. Yeah, not, in a, not according to contemporary epistemology and the Bayesianism that you yourself have used frequently to yes. formulate probability yeah. claims and so forth. 51%, uh, that's super variable. It goes up and down. Think about the, think about the Hillary example I just gave. I'm, I, I'm at 51% for Hillary winning, right? Yeah. Does that mean I believe Hillary's going to win? No. Well, I suppose that is going to depend on how much confidence you need, think is required for belief. I do, agree, that does, well, yeah. do, you, do you have a threshold of how much confidence is required to believe yeah. something? Yeah, yeah, in my example, I put it at 80. You can put it at 70 if you want, somewhere in there. It's going to be context dependent to some extent, depend on the, the topic uh -huh. at hand, but it's surely not 51. That, that sounds like you just plucked that out of the air. That, I did. <laughs> I, it's just an example. Okay. But, 
It's just an example, but it's got to be way higher than 51%, or at least considerably higher than that for a uh -huh. belief. I don't think All that, right, well, that was the question I yeah. wanted to address. Yeah, so, uh, if, or, so it's just as a recommendation for when you think about this in the future, I would look at work on confidence levels and outright belief and knowledge and see exactly whether you can argue that 51% is good enough for belief. I would expect that would be your move next time. Uh -huh. Yeah. So can I just ask about that? Um, I, I take it that part of what Dr. Craig's question is, is if I have, say, a 51% confidence level um, in some proposition, and uh, that's greater than my confidence level in the negation of that proposition. Which would be at 49. Okay, then, um, <laughs> then the question is, uh, you know, so belief or not belief, isn't, uh, haven't I done enough in terms of uh, uh, a conversation like this or a debate like this to show that, you know, uh, in terms of this evidence for God or some reason to believe in the existence of God, isn't that enough for these kinds of purposes? Professor Craig wants to say that he knows God exists, and he wants to say that these arguments should entitle a person, if they accept these arguments as good arguments, but I, I to know that God exists. But I've never made any claims about the level of confidence I know, you should that, have been. that one has you should in have. God. I mean, I, I, this is something well, to have I, been I thinking about. I don't think that's about. true, though, Kevin. I'm not even sure how one could measure that. I mean, theists must be all over the map in terms of their degree of confidence. Some people have, I like agree. Kierkegaard or, or others, have held to theistic beliefs despite great doubts Absolutely. and great existential angst. And others may have a more confident and buoyant belief in God. And Agreed. I, I, it doesn't seem to me that there is any sort of non-arbitrary level that you could set to say this is required to be a theist. I'm not saying it's required to be a theist. I'm okay. saying it's required for belief. I'm saying there's a difference, but there's a, a way that belief and confidence levels interact, and there's a certain threshold that you need to reach whoops, in order to get to belief. And that you don't appreciate in the way that you formulate your arguments. Could I, um, I just wanted to, just because we only have, I think, about 15 more minutes here, move on to another um, argument. So one thing that um, Dr. Sharp mentioned that I thought was pretty interesting, just as somebody who uh, follows these arguments only a, a little bit and do, don't really work in this area, was this appeal to the d divine psychology argument. And yeah, I was wondering what you thought about that, about the way in which some of these arguments uh, make claims about what God wants or God plans. And, and at the same time, it seems like we must have very little idea about what God's psychology is like. Right, I, I, and I would agree with that, that we wouldn't know a whole lot about uh, divine psychology, about what God would do under certain circumstances, but I don't see that that plays a, a significant role in the Kalam argument, for example, whose premises are very simple, that if the universe, the universe began to exist, and if it did, there must be a transcendent cause. Good. I don't see any role played in that argument by divine psychology. So far it doesn't, with the way you just laid it out. But what you need to think about is, well, there's two issues. One is, you formulate it mostly as an inference to the best explanation tonight. But usually you formulate it as a deductive argument. Well, I did both tonight. Well, inference to the best explanation is I mean, is I think inductive. the arguments can be formulated either way inductively well, or deductively. Those are different kinds of arguments, and the Kalam as an inductive argument is very different from the Kalam as a deductive argument. I think you should keep it as a deductive argument. It works much better for you because you don't appeal to God as an explanatory device in that way. So you, are you saying then, in the way I presented it tonight, it, it isn't vulnerable to your is. divine psychology It is. I haven't objection. gotten to that yet. So in the way that you lay out the, the premises, you say there's got to be something that caused the universe to come into being, and uh, let's call that thing God. Okay, great. Well, how would I know that God even would create the universe if I don't feel like I'm justified in believing that God would do that? Then why would I be justified in naming whatever caused the universe God? Yeah, well, I, I attempt to deduce some of the properties of the cause of the universe. Yes. And through such an analysis, what I derive is quite a striking number of theologically significant I attributes agree. that this cause must be beginningless, yep. uncaused, yep. timeless, yep. spaceless, immaterial, yep. enormously powerful, Fair personal That's creator the of the universe. The now that important. I think is a rich enough concept to be called God. Great. Now, well, apart now, from psychology. Now let's think for a minute. Why think that that thing would create the universe? And if it wouldn't, 
there's no reason to call whatever caused the universe to exist God. Even if it's personal. Even if it's timeless. It would, be, it would be a personal creator of the universe. Now, it would be a very strange form of atheism that admitted that there exists a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, enormously powerful personal creator of the universe, yep. whether you call it God or not. I agree. I don't, I don't agree with that part of the argument. I'm only pointing out a different problem with the entire thing. Okay, I guess I just don't see the problem. I, I, now, in the fine-tuning <laughs> argument, in yeah, the fine tuning, the fine -tuning. Argument, I think there's is, an element of psychology yeah. in that one, one says that the fine tuning of the universe is more probable yeah. given theism. an intelligent, yeah. Yeah, given theism, yeah. than it is given naturalism. Good, that's great. And, and, and there, it seems to me that all the theist needs to do is to show that it's not improbable that God would want to create a finely tuned universe. And, and that is surely going to be much, much more probable than on naturalism, all of these constants and quantities falling by accident into the life permitting zone. Good, I'm not gonna get sucked into that. Trying to have a discussion about what God would do or what he wouldn't do or anything like that, that's all divine psychology. And it's right. all equally murky and unclear. And I don't think we have any good reason to believe any of that stuff. So if you wanna, push the fine-tuning argument, then what you need to do is say that the chances that God would create the universe are actually better than the chances that it was created randomly given this fine-tuning. And yeah. you don't do that. Pardon me? You don't argue that. Well, I, I think I do. And oh, well, let's Robin, hear that. I Robin hear that. Collins well, in hear particular that. does that. In his formulations of the fine-tuning argument, he, 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 what he argues is that the uh, naturalist would have to show that there's some sort of significant improbability in the designers creating a finely tuned universe. Uh, and the probability of these constants and quantities falling into the life permitting zone is so I know, incomprehensible I get it. that the, theist, the atheist could never demonstrate that it's less probable than that, that a designer would want to create a finely tuned world. Why not? Why assume that? Why not assume, why not actually do the calculation and show me how likely it is that God would create the universe? Well, I think it's a matter of... What's the calculation? It, What's the probability? It, it, is it I like mean, you one in 10 to the 10th? Or you is can't it, put numbers on this You can't, kind of I agree. You can't, you and can that means is, you can't conclude what you want to conclude from the fine-tuning. What you can say is that given an intelligent designer of the universe, it's not improbable that he would finally tune it for why the existence justify of that? life. Justify, why, why think that it's not improbable that God would create a universe at all? You don't have to show that it's not improbable, but simply that the probabilities are not as low as all of these constants of quantities falling by accident into Good. the life permitting zone. And that awesome. is so absurdly improbable that I think it just outstrips any sort of um, um, uncertainty yeah. with respect to saying that a designer of the universe would finally tune the universe for agents. Excellent. So why isn't it absurdly improbable that God would create the universe? It's not absurdly improbable because God could have good reasons for, for doing that. He that's, could he want to could, create But that's not a basis for, form, for trying to calculate him, a probability. Uh, well, he could have reasons, yes. Right, and so but you the need to justify can't... that he does have reasons. Yeah, but the, the, the burden of proof here is on the atheist to show that this is somehow less probable than the constants and quantities falling into the life permitting zone by accident. And the theist doesn't need to show mm -hmm. that it is probable just to turn back the atheist's objections from divine psychology that, that this is highly, highly unlikely that a designer would want to do this. It, Mm -hmm. It seems to me if the, if the designer is good, he might very well want to create finite persons who could have a relationship with him. As you're fond of saying on your podcast, the burden of proof lies on the person making the assertion. Mm -hmm. Good. I want to move on to <laughs> one more thing. I think, well, this has been very good so far, but I'm just uh, conscious of time. Do I get to ask my question? Yeah, if you'd, like to, if you'd like to ask a question. So, Professor Craig, I, I wanted to ask you a question about love. Love? Yeah, love. So, you've said that all Christians have a duty to love God and 
you know, certainly one of the essential aspects of God's message is, uh, if you love me and believe in me, you're going to go to heaven, otherwise you'll suffer eternal damnation in hell. And if we just distill out the kind of core message there, it's something like, love me or I'm going to make you suffer. So being a Christian is fundamentally to put this sort of extortionist concept of love at the center of your life. It seems to me like kind of going through life with a gun to your head, or even better, yeah. maybe going through life with a gun to your soul. Yeah. So I want to ask you, how can you possibly think that's love or recommend this kind of relationship to other people? Yeah, Kevin, I don't think that. I think that's a gross caricature Good. of why. Christianity. Wanna... Good. And if that's what you think, it's no wonder you would reject it. Good. Let me, let me hear that. Uh, what? What? What the Bible says is that because of our, only, our own freely chosen evil and, and moral um, wrongdoing, we find ourselves spiritually alienated from God and morally guilty before him and, and culpable before him. But God loves us so much that he has sent his son into the world as a sacrificial offering yeah. to um, bear the punishment for our wrongdoing so that we might be forgiven and reconciled and come to know him and have eternal life. And it's up to us whether we want to accept that grace or not. And if we don't? And, and those who refuse it, you see, they refuse his forgiveness mm -hmm. and so find themselves still in this state of spiritual alienation, mm -hmm. culpability, and condemnation. They find and if they die there. in that state, they go into a state of eternal separation from God. But mm -hmm. it's not God who rejects them, it's they who reject God. Yeah, but God is still saying, if you don't love me and believe in me, you're going to go to hell and suffer, right? Is that wrong? I, that, I thought this was yeah, Christianity. That, that, that is wrong. I mean, what, he, what he's so, saying is, you're already morally guilty and culpable. You're, you're drowning. But I am, I'm going to save you if you will let me. But if you repulse me, if you push me away, then God has no choice. Oh, that's so unfortunate for God. He has no choice but to condemn the unbelievers to hell. Well, so, I mean, in one sense, I, it is wait, unfortunate. If I, if I could just step, I'm not sure that this. I mean, it's the, an the Bible wait, this is says, an interesting, God, please, Dr. Craig, with this people. Is, this is a very interesting line of discussion, but I'm not sure that it really okay. relates to either the arguments you laid out. No, or it, the it didn't. It, it, does, it does, actually, because I think one of the major important issues for, the, for understanding Christianity is the concept of love and God's love. And it does serve as evidence against Christianity to think that the concept of love here is not genuine love. That is an, a legitimate point. What I wanted to, in our last couple of minutes, um, I wanted to ask one more question related to something that um, Dr. Sharp presented, and then uh, there's uh, a question that I want to ask of each of you uh, to address to the audience. In some of what you presented, um, in one, one specific place you said you're not uh, on board with a kind of reductive naturalism. That's right. And I just wanted you to say a little bit more about that, because sometimes when you see debates like this, yes. um, uh, the, you know, with a, there are these physicists or other yes. people who are arguing really hard to basically prove that God doesn't exist because um, he, God isn't sort of part of a, yes. any sort of natural science, right. uh, scientific explanation. Yeah. And it seems like you're backing away from a kind of strong naturalistic claim, but I'm wondering yeah. what, what does that really come to in terms of a discussion I, like this? I think those are terrible arguments. I think we have no reason to believe that everything can be reductively explained in terms of science. And one of uh, Professor Craig's main uh, thrusts in his arguments is that the moral, moral uh, values and duties cannot be reductively explained in terms of science, and I agree 100% with him. But the atheist is not saddled with that position and instead can adopt a much more reasonable position that reductive naturalism is false and no part of atheism whatsoever. I think that's just a terrible way for the atheist to go. There's no reason to take on a gigantic explanatory burden when you don't need to. So just for people out here, what is a non-reductive naturalism? So non-reductive naturalism would be say there are moral values, they're real, they're objective, but you cannot explain them in terms of science. Good. And I, I, my position would be the theist has an explanatory ground for the objectivity of moral values and duties which are not available to the atheist. For the atheist, he can certainly affirm these 
but they're just sort of hanging in the air. There isn't any sort of explanatory ground for them, especially for moral duties. Why would we have a moral prohibition or obligation to do certain things if there is no moral lawgiver? It, it seems to me that duty is very mysterious on an atheistic view. Could I pick we're, up on one sure. other There point? are arguments in, I mean, in the history of moral philosophy and lots of uh, arguments about moral duties in a, it, that come from, that are objective, that come from a secular uh, yeah. background, right? And I'm sure you're aware of those. Of course. But, but you that just, doesn't but, mean but that they're adequate. It's not enough just to list them. Yes. I mean, after all, they're, they're, they can't all be right because they're mutually contradictory. But that aspect of them can be right. The non, not, uh, not reductive naturalist, objective, no appeal to God. That can be right. Yeah, I, I have tried to deal with some of these, for example, what I call atheistic moral Platonism or uh, humanism, which sees human flourishing as the good. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that all of these ultimately prove to be explanatorily inadequate. I Look see. At, okay. So that they're, 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 it's not that they sort of don't make any sense. Uh, at all, it's that ultimately you think they f they fail as moral theories for some well, right. They're, specific they're explanatorily reason. inadequate in that they don't have an adequate, uh, a, a plausible and non-arbitrary grounding for moral value and duty, which the theist has. I think theism is a superior moral theory in terms of its grounding of these. Okay. Good. Okay, so unfortunately we're coming to the end of this time, um, but I have a, a last question um, that um, the Veritas Forum wanted me to ask of each of you, and it's, and it's basically uh, something, uh, the answer should be addressed, I think, to the audience, everyone here. So it seems likely that each of you um, would agree that a university like Ohio State should be a place where people genuinely explore different ideas and weigh the evidences of various worldviews. And um, if we're intellectually honest, people should be open to changing our belief systems if the evidence merits this change. Based on tonight, what would you challenge Ohio State students to do or to consider going forward? Would you like to start? Sure. I would uh, encourage students who are interested to begin to um, read some of the literature on this material, particularly from the standpoint of Christian theism, there is a wealth of material available on our website, reasonablefaith.org. And I would uh, encourage students to avail themselves of the uh, articles that are there uh, on YouTube. There are many debates that you can listen to, as well as lectures. Um, there's a, a great wealth of material on all of these different arguments that I've shared tonight that's available on the website. And you might think about taking some philosophy courses here at OSU um, in order to acquaint yourself more yeah. here, here. with this material. Good. Thank you. Dr. Sharp? Yeah. So the advice I would have would be think critically. Subject your beliefs to critical scrutiny, and if they do not hold up, change them. And by doing that, you end up crafting your own belief system that you can use to live your life in the 21st century instead of relying on borrowed beliefs from whoever raised you. In the case of Christianity, you're relying on beliefs from the Iron Age. Thanks. Okay. Good, thanks. All right, if you can hear me, I think we're going to start the last portion of the evening with your audience questions. The first question that comes in to us is for uh, both of the speakers, each of the speakers. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Sharp, but then also ask the question of Dr. Craig. Uh, why do you care if someone holds your atheistic or theistic views? Well, I, I don't really care whether other people are atheists, uh, but I do care about whether people think critically about the best way to behave as a human being, about the best way to organize ourselves into groups, the best way to have a government or an election or an economy and what have you. And uh, I think that if you are um, pledging allegiance to a certain religious view without thinking critically about it, then that often leads you to say things that I think are rather arbitrary and rather unhelpful in these other situations. So I've got nothing against someone who is atheist but willing to think critically about all of these other issues, and in fact, divorce 
the positions that they take on social issues from what might be prescribed by the church. Dr. Craig? I believe that the ultimate purpose for which humanity was created was to be in relation with God. God is the fulfillment of human existence. Uh, he is an incommensurable good, uh, the locus of infinite value and love. And to know God and to be related to him forever is the end for which human beings were created. So I, I, that's why I think belief in God is so important. It is the first step toward coming into a relationship with God, experiencing his love, coming to know him and his forgiveness, and being in communion with God for eternity, which is a, a good than which no greater could be conceived. Okay. The second question is for Dr. Craig. It says, why, do, why does Dr. Craig believe the universe needs a reason for existing? Now, I'm not clear whether this is in reference to my contingency argument or the Kalam argument. With respect to the Kalam argument, I think it's very clear why there would need to be a cause of the universe because something can't come out of nothing. If you think about it, that's worse than magic to say the universe just popped into being uncaused. So clearly in that sense, there would need to be a cause. With respect to the first argument, the contingency argument, think again about the ball in the woods. The the ball can exist, but it doesn't have to exist. So what, what's the difference between the ball and, say, unicorns, which can exist, but do not exist? The difference is that the ball has an explanation of its existence. And just making the ball bigger until it's the size of the universe doesn't do anything to remove the need for an explanation. It's, the universe is just big. And the size of something doesn't do anything to explain why it exists or to remove the need for an explanation. Okay. Dr. Sharp, third question. And this is picking up on where we were near the end of our last part. If God does not exist, how could there be absolute moral values? Well, there can be absolute moral values because they're grounded in something other than God. For example, rationality or harm or any one of a number of different positions, and there's uh, lots of professional ethicists who are uh, working on uh, good theories of what it makes good things good and bad things bad, what makes right things right and wrong things wrong, and uh, there's a ton of these theories that appeal to harm or rationality or what have you, and no appeal to God whatsoever. The values that these theories uh, uh, explain are objective, they're independent of what anybody believes about them, they're not uh, uh, the sort of thing that you would get by saying it's just a sort of herd mentality that arrives by evolution, that's just not any part of these views, and so um, there's a perfectly good explanation for how moral values and duties exist even in a godless world. Just as a follow-up to that, is, is there anything added by the idea of having a lawgiver? I mean, which seem to be I don't think one so. of the main points that No, Dr. I don't Craig think so. Was. I think that um, the existence of God uh, is not a good explanation. It doesn't predict anything. It doesn't retrodict anything. It doesn't explain anything. The existence of God doesn't make the probability that there would be moral duties any higher. I'm going to keep trying to move along on these questions. It seems like you could both chime in on any of these questions, but it, since some of them are directed at... Um, just yeah. one or either. It seems uh, it's nice to try to get in as many as sure, possible, so I won't always give That's you fine. an opportunity to respond. Um, okay, Professor Sharp has not presented much evidence for the non-existence of God. Does he have any to present? I thought I gave a confidence argument. Who wrote that? I gave a whole argument about this. So. Think about the evidence that's out there. Let's, let's take the, uh, the, the Christian God, and the evidence that's out there is uh, a bunch of ancient manuscripts. And uh, if you're going to say that um, God is the best explanation for those uh, claims made in these ancient manuscripts, then you're making a claim that 
conflicts with our best scientific theories in biology and chemistry and physics, and you should have much higher confidence. I don't mean by a little bit, I mean by a mile in those scientific theories than you do in any claim about what needs to be explained in some ancient manuscript. That's the argument. It has to do with saying that you should have a higher confidence in our best scientific theories than in any existing evidence for any god. I can imagine better evidence for a god, but we don't have anything like that right now. So I'm not saying there's no such thing as miracles, there's no possibility that I would ever believe something supernatural. Of course I could believe something like that, but given the evidence we have right now, you're better off believing, or way better off believing in our best scientific theories. One of the things that puzzled me that I wanted to address during our Q&A time is that my appeal has been precisely to our best scientific theories. I'm not proposing alternatives to standard Big Bang cosmology, fine-tuning of the universe, uh, or the applicability of mathematics to the physical world. I don't see any conflict here at all because it is our best scientific theories that support some of the key premises in these theistic arguments. So I, I dispute that, but those arguments that you're pointing out are arguments for theism in general. They're not arguments for Christianity. I'm right, talking which about was particular the topic gods tonight, right? Well, I'm talking the about topic was, the topic was what's the is evidence, there for, evidence God? for God? Is, is, the, Although, is God capitalized in the in the title? I'll bet it is, and that means that you're talking about the Christian God there, oh, no, right? No, no, Although, no, so, no, Although, wait, let, let me jump in because the very next question uh, is, <laughs> Dr. Craig, if God exists. Why the Christian God? Well, all right, there and you go. Th yeah, see, and that, the, the arguments that I presented tonight are arguments that are common property of Jews, Muslims, and Christians. They would be def defended by, and have been defended historically, by persons in all of those great monotheistic traditions. The question of Christianity wasn't on the table tonight. If I were asked to defend why I am not simply a monotheist, but a Christian monotheist, then I would appeal to the person of Jesus of Nazareth and ask ourselves, who was this first century Jew? What did he claim? What did he teach about himself? What do we know about him? And I do think that the best historical evidence, and, and, and this is not uh, superstition or, or uh, things of that sort. We're talking about serious historical Jesus scholarship, is that this man made radical personal claims about himself and I think that the best explanation for the evidence concerning his ultimate fate is that God raised him from the dead in vindication of those claims and that therefore there's quite good reason for being not simply a monotheist but a Christian monotheist. This, I take it, right, is the resurrection argument yeah, that's that, the resurrection that you argument. represented in your yeah. slide with arguments. Right, yeah, and I, and I think that, um, I think that an explanation for the four facts that you usually yes. cite there for uh, the basis of the resurrection argument, anything that's going to be compatible with our best theories in biology, chemistry, and physics is going to be a better explanation than that. So, for example, uh, aliens took the body. Doesn't sound like a very good explanation to me, but it's a way better explanation than resurrection because aliens are at least compatible with our best scientific theories. So is that really what you're going to appeal to? to it is. You're really, really going to appeal to resurrection. Resurrection is yeah. incompatible. I, it's, but, but surely that's not right. I mean, of you course know enough right. about the literature concerning the problem of miracles. I do, absolutely. To realize do. And now what's your move now? miracles are not incompatible with Wrong. the laws of I disagree nature. with that, and that is not right at all. Uh, scientific theories do not have secret Keteris Paribus clauses in front of them. No, they do not. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. How, all right, the next question from the audience. <laughs> I don't think I'm doing anything funny half the time that you laugh. There you go again. <laughs> how is confidence level, I think this must be for Dr. Sharp, how is confidence level protected from bias or subjectivism. How does one measure a confidence level beyond being confident or not confident? Yeah, so confidence level is measured by uh, your tendency to make various gambles using uh, the, uh, particular theories of rationality, decision theory, game theory, and so forth. And confidence levels are used throughout, uh, well, philosophy, social sciences, all over the place, because they're super helpful and they're very precise. 
Um, how are they not impacted by bias? They are. Of course they're impacted by bias. Professor Craig is biased. I'm biased. You can't but be biased, and the best thing that you can do is try to guard against cognitive biases the best the way that you can, and that's by thinking critically about your beliefs. Do you want to chime in on that one? Only that I share the questioner's skepticism about confidence levels. I, at least with respect to theism, I, when I introspect into my own life, I'm not sure how I would assess the confidence level that I have. I mean, I'm staking my life on this. Agreed. But I'm not sure what confidence level I have. I don't know how to even answer a question like that. So can I follow up on that a little bit to say, I mean, part, we focused a lot on sort of arguments and evidence and the kinds of reasons we can bring to bear either in favor or against um, uh, the existence of God. Uh, but it does seem, and just as sort of a lay person in this sense, it does seem a lot of what we're doing is butting up against the limits of what we can really understand and reason. And, um, you know, when you start talking about things about the, the beginning of the universe, for instance, or some kind of a transcendent uh, cause mm -hmm. and what that could even mean when it's sort of outside of s space and time. And, um, and I guess I, I, one way to pose this question is, would be have to do with faith, say. Like, what's the place of faith when we're butting up against the limits of reason? But, I mean, another way to put it would be to say, I mean, how much of this can we even be reasonably articulating, e either for or against? And how much of this um, is, is uh, essentially never going to be settled? Um, does either of you yeah. want to take on some version of that question? You want that one? Um, yeah. I think that we do have conceptual clarity about what we're talking about. I mean, with respect to the beginning of the universe, contemporary cosmology is shot through with metaphysical and philosophical concepts. And so I do think we have a fairly clear grasp of these concepts. They are very strange and alien, I think, probably to the average person. But philosophers talk about things like God's atemporality or his relationship to time or divine aseity. I'm working on divine aseity and abstract objects right now. You can't get something much more ethereal than that. And yet I, I think we have good conceptual clarity about a lot of these questions, even though they're very far removed from mundane affairs. But I just, uh, I continue to come back to this strange question about belief and confidence. I, I believe that these premises are true I believe that the conclusions, the arguments are true. And, but, but if you were to ask me about confidence, it, I, don't, I just don't have any sort of way of assessing that. I, I simply believe that the evidence points to the truth of these and that the conclusions are therefore true. Good. But the way that you formulate them is you say that they're more probable than not. So you do think that your confidence level is higher than 50% with yes. respect to the premises. But, yes. So you do have a way of assessing it. Okay, but, but you said that that degree of confidence isn't enough for belief. Yeah, you, there's something that you need, to, you need a certain level of confidence for uh, outright belief yeah, or that's, knowledge. That's, I guess it's, that's what's not clear to me. Yeah. I don't see why it needs to pass some threshold in order to believe, because well, I certainly do believe right. these premises. I, do I agree. believe the conclusions, right. but I wouldn't know how to put a figure on confidence. Am I 75%, am I 80%, am I... 65, I, I wouldn't even know how to answer a question like that. So there's more work to do then. So wh one last question. I know we're uh, just gone over time, um, but it's an important question, so I don't want to fail to ask it. Um, I'm, I'm going to move over to the podium as I ask it because I have then some closing comments about what will happen afterwards. So a lot of you, you've both presented arguments in favor of your view, against the view you um, disagree with. But when you think about your own view, um, is there any part of it that you personally struggle with the most, that you see uh, as a potential failing in the view and that makes you worry about your own view? Um, it, or, or um, yeah, let me just leave it at that. Yeah. Is, there some, is there something you worry about in your own view or in the other person's view that you think is, is onto something that makes you think? Yeah, I, I had a worry um, about God's relationship to abstract objects like numbers and propositions and 
possible worlds and things, it seemed to me that these were uncreated realities and were therefore incompatible with the existence of God because God is the creator of everything apart from himself. But over the last dozen years, I've been studying this problem and have come to some uh, resolution of it where I feel quite good about this so this worry doesn't bother me anymore. Because it is interesting. I mean, these, the arguments do change over time. I mean, over the centuries, over the decades, the, yeah. the kinds of arguments that are offered. So we do find that some arguments don't work as well as others, and yeah. then we find... I, I am constantly thinking about these things, reflecting on them. I want to second the importance of what Kevin Sharp has said about critical thinking about your own beliefs. I, this is something that I am constantly engaged in doing as a philosopher, and I've changed my mind about a, a number of things in the process of, of doing so. Thanks. Dr. Sharp, is there something that personally worries you about your own view or something in the other, the opponent's view that worries you? I'm not worried about the, the arguments for it or the, the, um, content, the cogency of the view or anything like that, but um, there are certain aspects of uh, being an atheist that are um, unpleasant to some extent, but I think there's also much to be um, happy about. So it's not that there's something that worries me about the position, about the theoretical position. It's rather um, uh, how do you uh, go about um, how do you go about living life as a as a human being who's struggling just like you and you to figure out how we should live and what we should do and what we should believe and all of those things. We're all in the same boat there. And so I think that the, the worries I have are associated with that more than the, the sort of cogency of the view. Well, thank you both. So um, it, we've reached the end of our time, and so I have um, just a closing statement um, about what's coming next. Uh, what we want to do first is make note of a very important thing, that there are going to be donuts and coffee <laughs> uh, provided afterwards. I think those must be the undergraduates clapping. Um, so if you'd like to stick around and, and discuss any of this further uh, with um, either of the speakers or with any of uh, members from our sponsoring organizations, they're all going to be around. Dr. Craig and Dr. Sharp in particular will be at each end of the stage. And if your question was not asked during Q&A, you're welcome to form a line and ask them a question. Please keep your questions brief. Be mindful that others are going to be waiting also to be asking their questions. So finally, on behalf of the Veritas Forum and our sponsors, uh, thank you very much for your attendance and participation, and thank you to both of our speakers. That was very hard hitting. I enjoyed it. It was really fun. Hey, I've got it. Okay. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.